Welcome to the lecture on economic growth. This video updates you on the material we would have covered during the MISC class. Once you finish watching this video, you can go on and attempt the homework on My Econ Lab. We are talking about power of economic growth. Consider three countries with the same starting uh, level of GDP per capita uh, in the year 1810. What difference does it make if each country grew at marginally different rates? So let's take the example of one country which grew at 0%, uh, another one which grew at 1%, and yet another one which grew at 2%. So the 2% example would be similar to what we see in the United States. Of course, if the economy doesn't grow at all, then whatever was the level of GDP per capita in 1810 is going to be the same as in 2010. Now let's look at what happens if the economy grew at 1% over the period of 200 years. So we can see that $1,000 of GDP per capita in 1810 becomes $7,316 at 1% of growth rate in 200 years. However, look at the numbers for 2% growth rate and you can see the remarkable difference between uh, the country that grew at 1% and the country that grew at 2%. So even though marginal differences uh, might make growth rates seem small, but they can imply a much greater uh, differences in standard of living over a period of time. As you can see, if a country grew at 2% for 200 years, then the $1,000 per capita GDP in 1810 would become $52,485 in 2010. And that's what we call as the power of economic growth. And it is one of the reasons uh, why uh, growth rates or growth experiences differ so much across the world. That is, because the new economic growth develops on the old economic growth, the effect is compounded and therefore small differences in growth rates could mean large differences in per capita real GDP over a period of time. Let's look at what exponential growth implies about the growth experiences of rich versus poor countries and fast versus slow growers. We are going to use uh, data from 1960 to 2010, where GDP per capita is in PPP adjusted 2005 constant dollars. As you would remember, this is uh, real GDP per capita. So let's look at the richest and the poorest economies in the world. As you must remember from our discussion about differences in aggregate incomes across the world, Luxembourg is one of the richest is the, is the richest country in the world. Uh, so in 1960, its per capita real GDP was 17,601, and in 2010 it became 75,589. What was the growth rate? That was implied by this uh, differences in per capita GDP growth rate, uh, per capita GDP levels. So the growth rate was 2.91%. Singapore, on the other hand, started at 4,383 real GDP per capita in 1960, and in 2010, uh, it had real GDP per capita of $55,862. The implied growth rate is 5.22%. And then you have these countries which are the poor, one of the, some of the poorest countries in the world. And you can see that at least three of them here have grown negative at a negative rate, which means they have experienced a decline in their standard of living over this period of time, that is 50 years. How about we look at fastest and slowest growing economies? We know that the fastest growing economies like Singapore, Botswana, South Korea, Taiwan, 
and Equatorial Guinea, Equatorial Guinea uh, grew at approximately 5.5% on an average. And you can see that that has led to a phenomenal increase in the standard of living based on real GDP per capita. But the slowest growing economies uh, here, Guinea, Madagascar, Central African Republic, Niger, and Democratic Republic of Congo, each of them grew at negative rates. And therefore, you can see that the real GDP per capita actually declined over a period of time from 1960 to 2010. So both in terms of increase or decrease, small differences in growth rate and large differences in standard of living as measured by real GDP per capita. What about the implied average growth rates for all countries? So the next slide will show you a uh, majority of nations have experienced average annual growth rate in real GDP per capita of 1% to 3%. So you can see that uh, up to 3% of growth rate, uh, you mostly have all the developed economies. And then uh, towards the bottom, you basically have the slowest growing or uh, economies or countries which have negative growth rates. On the higher end, uh, on the other hand, about 3%, you basically have the emerging economies like India and China and the countries which have grown at a very high rate for the last 50 years. So, what about the longer time period? So now we're going to look at the data that was collected by Angus Madison, uh, after whom the project is named as the Madison Project. Uh, he estimated data uh, for very long historical period, but we are going to look at a uh, period after 1820 and try to figure out what are the implied growth rates uh, for few of these countries. So let's look at UK, for example. In 1820, UK was the richest country with a per capita real GDP of $2,854. In 2010, uh, its per capita real GDP went up to $32,722. And the implied growth rate for the full 200, 190 year period was 1.29%. And for uh, just 90 year period, it was 1.85. What about the United States? Again, you can see that there is a really very small difference between 1.85 and 1.91. Or, for example, 1.29 and 1.65, though this difference is greater than this difference, they still both less than 2. But you can see the difference that it has made for United States. For example, US ranked second in 1820. And today, it has at least $9,000 more of per capita real GDP compared to England or UK, which was ranking first in 1820. All right, so what's the takeaway? One is what we call as the catch-up growth rate. Poor countries tend to grow faster or catch up to rich countries as they adopt the production and technologies of the richest countries. This kind of explains the uh, phenomenal economic growth rates of countries like China, India, Brazil, Russia, or for example, in this table, you can think about Chile, South Korea, uh, and Hong Kong. Of course, catch up growth rate is not guaranteed. And that you can see from example of Argentina, which failed to grow to its complete potential over a period of time. And here again, you can see the difference. 
with 1.23 and 1.29 between England and Argentina, uh, the difference here is much larger than difference here. So catch up growth rate. Poor countries tend to grow faster or catch up to rich countries as they adopt the production and technologies of the richest countries. So they are not developing, developing anything new, but they are taking advantage of all the technologies and knowledge that they have available to them uh, to use. Through that, they basically accumulate capital and human capital and continue to grow. So they have three sources of economic growth. One is physical capital, second is human capital, and the third is adoption of technology. Examples from the table, we have Chile, Hong Kong, and South Korea. And from the current examples, we have uh, India, China, uh, Brazil. However, Argentina reminds us that catch-up growth is not guaranteed. Uh, it has to come with some policies that allows people to take advantage of the available knowledge and technology. On the other hand, Countries like United States and UK and many other West European countries have shown a, a much steady growth rate over a long period of time. This is what we call as sustained growth. The main source of growth here is technological advances. Most of these countries have already accumulated huge amount of physical capital stock as well as human capital. So there is not much benefit to be had by adding to both physical capital or human capital. So these are not the sources of economic growth for these countries. So what are the sources? For these countries, the sources, the source, the most important source of economic growth is uh, uh, development of new technologies. So we have to create that new faster processing chip. We have to create new uh, technologies uh, that help us to uh, do whatever we are doing currently very differently and do new things uh, from it. So you have iPads, smartphones, tablets, even faster smartphones, tablets, and so on. Examples, uh, United Kingdom, United States, France, and Spain. So from this, we know, uh, we now come to uh, kind of summarize our understanding of how does a nation's economy grow. We have seen this production function before, where uh, Y is the real GDP, A is the technology, and K and H are capital and human capital, respectively. So one increases a country can grow by increasing its stock of physical capital K. It can grow by increasing the total efficiency units of labor H. Both of these sources contribute a lot to the developing country's economic growth rate and hence contributes to the catch-up growth rate. The third one, improving its technology, is the major source of growth for developed economies like United States, United Kingdom, uh, and other West European countries. So how does a nation's economy grow? Let's think about capital accumulation. So consider a simple economy where there is no government, no exports, no imports. So that uh, we don't have G, we don't have X, we don't have M. Therefore, on the expenditure side, you just have Y is equal to C plus I. On the income side, we know that income is equal to whatever we spend on consumption and whatever we don't spend at all, which is nothing but savings. So now we can see the relationship between this equation here and this equation here. What does that tell you? It tells you that in such an economy, savings should be equal to investments. Now remember, there is a lot going on here. In this equality, there's a whole financial sector which works to uh, getting your savings to the best possible use 
uh, or the use that gives you the best rate of return for the given amount of risk. The question is, where do savings come from? Savings comes from you and me. We determine how much of our income should be consumed and how much of it should be saved. This is an optimal decision because it involves a trade-off. Consumption today brings immediate happiness, while savings leads to future consumption and thus future happiness. For example, if you save enough, you might be able to put down the initial money for buying a new house. Or you might be able to buy uh, the latest washer and dryer to replenish uh, your laundry. The individual consumption saving decision is ultimately an optimization problem where the relevant price is the interest rate. When we add all these individual decisions together, that's when we determine the savings rate of the economy. Of course, higher the savings rate, higher would be the capital accumulation. Of course, physical capital by itself cannot generate sustained growth because it has diminishing marginal product. The same would be for about uh, human capital. Given the human, uh, given the physical capital, even human capital has diminishing marginal product, and therefore they cannot be the sources of sustained economic growth rate. They would allow you to catch up, but to, in order to grow after that, you basically have to uh, develop new technologies. So look at this picture. We started with candles and today we have the most advanced lighting technology. Well, what does that really mean in terms of technological change? Technological change is the process in which new technologies and new goods and services are invented, introduced, and used in the economy. Such change can generate sustained growth. As an example, look at uh, the price of light over uh, 200 years. In 1800s, uh, to have 100 lumen, uh, 1000 lumens of light you would have had to pay something close to $800. And so you can imagine that very few houses would actually have electricity or could afford electricity. Today, we pay less than 10 cents to get that much amount of light. And therefore, we have many more things possible uh, because of this technological progress. So technological change leads to more than a constant increase. It's not just uh, just ten more having ten more units. It is exponential. In that, the rate of increase is approximately constant, such as ten percent. Why? New innovations and technologies build on existing stock of knowledge, building on the shoulder of giants, and thus are not subject to diminishing returns.